Hello. Today is August 22nd, 2013, and we are in Bellingham, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Bellingham Menden Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Marjorie Turner Holman. Our cameraman is Eric Fisher of ABMI Cable 8 TV. We're privileged today to have with us Linda Calderiso. Welcome and thanks for coming. Thank you, Marjorie. All right, I have some questions for you, Linda. Um, to begin with, what is your full name? My full name is Linda Marie Calderiso. And your maiden name? My maiden name was Kavanaugh, with a K and no U, and uh, McEwen. I was formerly known as uh, Linda McEwen as that well. Was, that was your other married yes. name? Yes. Okay. Yes. And when and where were you born? I was born in Charlestown, Mass., in the, the 60s, in 1960. 1960? 1960. 1960. Okay. And um, what you said that you lived in Malden? Malden. You I grew, grew up, up in Malden. Okay. Yes, I grew up. Uh, we moved to uh, Malden when I was 12. So I grew up there and stayed there until we bought our first home um, mm -hmm. in the in the eight, it, the 90s. Yeah. Okay. And what did your parents do for work? Uh, my dad was a shipping manager. Uh, he worked for a Hyde Sockney spot built, and my mom was it worked at a credit union. Um, she was mostly stay-at-home mom. She didn't work until much later in life, till mm -hmm. we were all grown. And and you had siblings? I yes, I do. Um, I you do and did. <laughs> Unfortunately, I lost my brother a couple of years ago. But um, yes, I have a, a sister, and I had two brothers, and I'm the oldest of uh, of four. Mm -hmm. The oldest of four. It sounds like you've lost both brothers. No, I just lost the the, okay. the one brother. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. All right, um, and I believe you said that your dad was in the service. He was in the service. He was in the service, and um, that's probably a, one of the one of the main reasons why I, I um, joined the service. Um, was to follow in his footsteps. He didn't make a career out of it, um, but I know it was a lot of the best years of his life. Um, and it, it was funny, I always compare myself to be the son that he wished he had. <laughs> <laughs> and what branch of, our, of the service was army. he? he, he was, was in the he army. He was army, yes. He was okay. active duty army. And he spent his time over in, uh, in, Europe, okay. in Europe. In World War II? In World War II. Okay. And what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, um, I was a secretary for an insurance company, um, and I enlisted on a whim. Um, I actually always wanted to join the military. I wanted to join right out, out of high school. And I had an uncle who was a Green Beret who told me that there were only two types of women who joined the military, and I had better not be either one of those. <laughs> so I listened to him for many years, and um, it was an impulse when I joined. Um, I had taken the train home and walked past the recruiting station, and I'm convinced that if it was an Air Force or a Navy recruiter, I probably would have joined that branch instead. But um, it was an Army recruiter, and um, well, I, now I joined. You had children. I did. I did. I had um, two young sons. They were two and three years old um, at, at the time. And I was in the middle of a divorce, and I wanted to do something too that would make them th them proud of me, and, mm -hmm. and and to teach them work ethic, and to do something much bigger than myself. And can't get anything much more bigger than yourself than um, than joining the military. And and what year was this in London? That was in 1986. I always confuse the year, but I'm almost positive it's 1986. Okay. Um, so tell me about um, your enlisting. Tell me about that. My enlisting. Okay. My enlisting. Um, I can tell you, I had to do a, a lot of things before I got there. Before before. En enlisting. Once I left, I, w I went into what was, what's called the delayed entry program. So I had three months before I actually went to basic training. So I had time to prepare and get really nervous about my decision. Um, probably rethought it a thousand times, um, but uh, certainly not a decision that I 
that I ever uh, regretted. Mm -hmm. um, I worked, like I said, I worked full time and I was a single mother for two children. So that was back in the day before internet banking or anything like that. So having to get all my ducks in a row with making sure daycare was paid and the rent was paid and and um, having having things in place before I left. So right. there was there was a lot there was a lot of things to do bef before that um, before actually leaving. Wow. Um, well, there's a. Um, I think you told us how, when, and why you enlisted, and I think we've got a picture of you in your um, with all of your boot camp people. So tell me about when you. Um, when you went into boot camp and um, oh there you are <laughs> that's that's well after boot camp <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, d during boot camp um, one of the requirements when you enter boot camp is to you need to do a push-up one men's military push-up and growing up and going to gym class we never did men's push-ups. We did the ones on the knees. <laughs> and that was a requirement. Uh -huh. And un uh, unfortunately, I could not do the one men's push-up. So what is required is if you can't do that push-up, they send you to what's called the fat farm. <laughs> so I was at the fat farm doing push-ups and more push-ups and more push-ups um, till uh, I think it was two weeks. Two oh, weeks right. we needed to be there. That, that I, I, how politically incorrect to call it, the fat farm, but m um, most of the people that were there were because they didn't make the, rate, the weight requirement. Mm -hmm. It's you have to follow guidelines and um, it, the, my weight was not an issue. The, the issue was the fact that I couldn't do. You just didn't have I the endurance. Didn't have the, I didn't have the endurance to do one. Oh, the picture that you just um, saw was a picture of um, doing the Army physical uh, fitness test. And mm -hmm. after that, I took great pride in making sure that I always completed my physical fitness test as I never wanted to do the minimum. I was intent on doing the maximum. So you never let yourself get that out of shape again. Nope, never <laughs> let that, never let that happen again. Uh, it's, it's too easy to revert back, so it's always best to just keep in that in, in that shape, because uh, I think we have another picture of you holding a medal. Yes. And what was that about? That was about there it is. yes. That <laughs> was that was about um, this was uh, after the, what's called the Patriot Games. Um, the unit that I belonged to had a competition, and you had to score a certain test, a certain score on your PT test, your physical training test, in order to participate. Mm -hmm. So that was um, that was a matter of pride to be able to participate in the in the Patriot Games and to um, to take first in my in my age group. So, so it really changed your life. It did. It definitely did. Okay. Um, talk to me about um, a 9/11. How how you felt about worrying with your family and um, and all of that. Well, 9-11 changed everybody's life, not just mine or my family's, but um, for the military part of it, I was actually uh, promoted on September 8th. I was, I was officially promoted 2001. To, mas to Master Sergeant. Oh, uh, let me rephrase that. I was promoted before, but I interviewed for the position um, that I was promoted into on September 8th. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the interview, nobody ever heard about what we we did. It was um, a, we we were referred to as attached to the unit, so we didn't actually physically um, drill with the rest of the unit. We were kind of like off to the side. And up until 9/11, our focus was on if there any emergencies arose within the New England states. So if you think about before 2011, you never really heard of any... Or 2001. 2001. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, sorry about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. Um, you, we would be responsible for any uh, emergencies. You never hear in New England about any tornadoes or earthquakes. Or, so there wasn't really 
And this is beyond lot. what the National Guard would do. Correct. The difference between the National Guard and the emergency prepared liaison officers, we we're all part of the United States Reserves. The Reserves is a federal, um, we belong to the federal government, whereas the National Guard belongs to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that's a big, um, in, the benefit for our position is we didn't need to wait to orders. We could arrive to assist on our own, um, our own detail of what our jobs were involved up to a certain amount of, of days or, or hours. So um, part of that function was being an emergency prepa prepared liaison officer is um, terrorist attacks and hmm. um, up until 9-11 that was that just was never heard from so it okay. and I knew things were really um, of a high degree of importance because I was accepted into the position on September 8th I was interviewed and accepted and I happened to be on Fort Devens on 9-11 when the planes hit the World Trade Center. And I happened to have been going out, out on a run and there just to complete paperwork for the transition to my new mm -hmm. position. And I knew when they were able to get me a security clearance within a half an hour, which is usually something that takes weeks mm -hmm. and possibly months to achieve and I had a security clearance and I was on my way to the the Maynard bunker within a half an hour so I wow. definitely knew that um, and it was it was very interesting first day of work to <laughs> um, to say the least uh, definitely to say the least <coughs> So 9-11 was your first day on the job? My first day on the job, yes. I remember having uh, one of the on colonels that job. on that job, yes, and mm -hmm. one of the colonels asking me to send a fax and had to ask where the fax machine was. Um, just to, I remember literally not leaving my seat because m my function at the time was answering the phone. And what a lot of people may not know about 9-11 is Region 2, which New York is part of, they didn't have any communication. So for the first 48 hours, any request for assistance or any communications came through our region. So we were handling all the requests for any military assets for the first the first 48 hours. All the jets that were flying, all patrolling. All the jets. Um, it, it was very... Um, interesting, um, one of the missions was um, they needed batteries. They needed actual batteries for their walkie-talkies. And it just happened to be that the colonel I was sitting with knew a pilot. We got through to the FAA and we were, were able to ship these batteries. And that was one, one of our missions. Um, one of the missions that came across our desk in what our what our position is as, as Department of Defense liaisons is, is is cutting through to what is actually needed. Um, I have an example where mm -hmm. um, they wanted heavy lift helicopters as one of the, the assets that was requested for, um, for assistance and in, in New York. In New York. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if we didn't ask the why do you need these heavy lift helicopters, what would have happened is these heavy lift helicopters would have came came in and and spread the debris all over the place be, but the person who was asking for that wouldn't have known that that's that's why they have us is to is we kind of sift through to see what's the best asset and the best way to assist so it um, sounds it, like you said don't send heavy lift helicopters. Did, don't send heavy lift helicopters exactly and what did they do instead um, I can't tell you exactly what okay. um, what it was, but that would be one our function as emergency okay. prepared liaison officers is in in a lot of times you know they don't the our emergency partners may not realize that if they want a, a plane they want a military plane that there's other ways um, civil air control um, can get the job done faster and quicker and for a lot less 
a um, lot, lot less of taxpayers' money. So that's what we that's what we do in this position. And it was a in in this position, um, we planned for we exercised emergencies. We planned for a hurricane response, a, um, earthquake response, and t before I got they they would also do terrorist response as well um, but so it was pretty interesting to not be exercising our position but to be actually um, oh, so having a piece of it putting it to work putting it to putting it to work I can't say I, I drew from experience because that was my first day on the job and wow. I didn't have any experience to um, to draw from so wow. yeah you never forget the people that you you met and worked with on that day when you sat side by side with them and um, yeah it was just interesting to think, and, and, and you say your family, my, my um, oldest son is in the Air Force. Yes. And he was in Turkey um, and that day, he happened to be a, have a day off. And was uh, he in the Air Force He was in then? the Air Force, yes. Mm -hmm. He was in the Air Force and he was in Turkey and calling home, not knowing what was going to hit, what was going to happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think of my poor husband who, you know, doesn't know if he's going to be shipping, you know, one or both of us off. Wow. Uh, so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was a try. It was, um, you know, you just try to keep the normalcy of your life as, the, as things around you start to unfold. You were talking to me about when your son was very little and you were trying to stay in touch with them and the pay phones and such. Tell me, tell me about that. That would be my experience in basic training. Ah. The, the, the preparation, I talked about the pre preparation, mm -hmm. but back in the day, um, back to, during uh, basic training days, you could use the phone every other day and it was a pay phone. So you sat in line for oh, maybe about half an hour to place a phone call and you hope that somebody picks up because um, answering machines were just making their way out. And Danny was three years old and I remember- This is your son. This is my oldest son, mm -hmm. Daniel, Danny and Patrick were home. And I remember Danny, talking to Danny uh, after waiting a half an hour for the phone and he had to let me go because Mr. Rogers was on. <laughs> so I remember, yep, taking place to, to Mr. Ro taking the back seat to Mr. Rogers um, at the time. And there was plenty of times that you'd wait for that phone call just to have that um, touch of home. Because mm -hmm. uh, your kids were how old then? They were two and three. Oh gosh. When I, when I went Very in. Very young. And Patrick was younger and it was just so heartbreaking to not really understand what he was, what he was telling me at the time. And mm -hmm. there wasn't a phone call that went by that I didn't get off that phone crying and homesick and, you know, but got to do what you got to do. What you gotta do. But mm -hmm. yeah, Mr. Rogers took, yeah, he took front and center <laughs> for, for uh, it's for Daniel, so, for Danny. Oh, goodness. Um, well, tell me more about, um, tell me more about um, the, where you served and um, the details. Uh, uh, aside from 9-11, after 9-11, our position was one in which the military, um, another unique part about um, my position there is, we worked together as um, what's referred to as a, 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 they refer to it as the the purple team because it would it was comprised of army um, it, coast guard which then became part of ultimately ended up becoming part of the department of transportation um, the marines uh, air force uh, navy so we all collectively worked together and up until 9-11, nobody really knew about us or what we did. But after that, um, we, our unit specifically, we went and worked um, for Hurricane Ivan and Jean in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. We worked alongside and supported uh, FEMA Region 4 um, for their hurricane efforts. Um, anytime, anytime there's a, even a disaster now or, there, or there's warnings, that you'll find a Department of Defense liaison located in the Emergency Operations Center for each region and also in each state has their own emergency prepared liaison officer. So we, ha we did respond also to Hurricane um, Ivan and Jean um, why I was part of um, why I was part of the, the coordinating disaster relief relief exactly. Okay. 
Exactly. Is that a change from before 9-11, um, or, or is it? No, we were always there, but nobody really knew about us. So that was kind of a change, and they also figured out what we could bring to the table. That was, that was probably one of the biggest, um, the so, biggest changes. So other people have learned to ask for help that was there that they didn't even know to ask for? Exactly, didn't know it was, it, it was there for them. And oh, okay. you know, we can't always honor the request, but we always are there to help them figure out the best way in, in which to, to work with them because we're mm -hmm. always in support of these emergency um, functions. Mm -hmm. We're never in charge of them. We are always there for support. Mm -hmm. for support. So. Good. All right. Um, I think we have a picture of you in on on the sh um, there's some other pictures and I'm not sure what we were going to Oh, yeah, okay. This is um in um, uh, Georgia. Yes. FEMA region 4 working the um, the disaster for Hurricane Ivan and Jean. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the emergency prepared liaison officer, the principal, um, the gentleman with the glasses. Mm -hmm. And that's Major HD, um, another one of my coworkers um, responding. We, and we had 24 hour operations there, so we okay. um, split, our, split our time accordingly. Mm -hmm. so. But that's what it would look like. That's that's each region is different. Um, an emergency center mm -hmm. sometimes it, it could be a really small room, and mm -hmm. um, I, I responded in a different capacity. I'm now I now work with FEMA as an as a reservist. So mm -hmm. I responded to I went to New York for um, Hurricane Sandy. Oh, okay. So I'm still involved in emergency management, but in a I'm just wearing a different hat now. I'm not because you're uniform. out. You're retired. I'm retired. From the Army. Yes, I've been retired from uh, um, from the army for three years now. Okay, but you couldn't let go of what you knew. No, couldn't get, let go of what. <laughs> no, no, I could not. I could not, and I'm glad I didn't. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely glad I didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we also had a picture of you on the shooting range, and um, there you are. Yep, that's me. I know you can't really tell, probably not my best side, but <laughs> yeah. yes, um, it, it, and that's the other part. I, I, I retired from the Army Reserves, and you know, the Reserves, what people may not know is, is even though we're reservists, we still have full-time responsibilities, so we may not be there every day of the year, but our training is the same training that um, the, uh, the regular army receives the um, leadership schools I've attended. I've attended with full-time, um, uh, full-time army, and also with um, national guardsmen as well. So we all uh, taught the same information. It's just that our, it, and, and it's a little bit tougher to stay ahead of your skills and when it's a, it's a part-time, sure, part-time position. Sure. So. Okay. Um, You've received some medals. Can you tell me about them? Um, I received one of my other functions before, one of my other positions before I, I became an emergency prepared liaison. As also another piece of history, um, is I was what's referred to, I was part of the Inspector General Corps. And within the military, the Inspector General Corps is like the IRS. Once they find out you're the IG, nobody wants to talk to you. But, um, but this is still within the Army. This is still within the Army. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of that position, I received an award for my work with um, sensing sessions and surveys um, that were brought about because of tail hook and abilene the sexual proving abuse guides. Sexual abuse. Sexual harassment. Service. Sexual harassment. So mm -hmm. our our section was tasked with doing 100% of all the, re the reserve units throughout New England, which entailed uh, 10 out of the 12 summer weekends um, that we were tasked to go out and to perform the sensing sessions. With the sen a sensing session, it's like a group inter interview set, um, session. It's mm -hmm. kind of to see what the climate is of the unit and, and some of the stories that I've heard um, were just pretty amazing that things like that happened 
you know, w within the military. With the harassment. With the, har with the harassment. You, you, so heard I, I, more, you heard more stories. And I, I received a, an award for that and mm -hmm. um, rece received recognition for mm -hmm. um, my, on the PT committee, the physical training committee, because um, once I stayed heavily involved in that. Mm -hmm. And um, my upon my retiring, I received the meritorious uh, service um, award mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so. Um, are there any other military experiences that you wanted to share? Um, my, uh, let's see, it, I just happened to be in the military during that, that um, time frame, but uh, attending the Women's Memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. was, um, it was great to be part of another part of there history. You are. There, yeah. we, there we are. This is the candlelight vigil from the um, Lincoln Memorial. And to be part of that and to listen to um, the person all the way to the left is one of my mentors. Um, that's Beth Lyle. And she, um, she was a whack back in the day. And to hear the stories of what, how they paved the way for us is, is very interesting. Because without them, um, we may not be there. So a lot mm -hmm. has changed since, mm -hmm. um, um, since Beth. But it was really amazing to be part of something so huge and to be part of history. Which This is the Women's Memorial, which is different than the Korean Memorial out there. This particular memorial um, honors all the women in, in the military. Across the bran across military branches. The, across all the ban branches. And it's part of the, it's at the entrance of Arlington National Cemetery. So it was really a unique and interesting experience that mm -hmm. I'm glad I got to participate in. Because I think we have one more picture of you at the Women's Memorial. Yep, that's at the, yep. right, you can see in the background there, that's the entrance to um, Arlington National Cemetery, and you can see. Okay. Um, it was. It's a huge crowd there. It is a huge crowd. It was. And when was that? Um, oh, gosh. You can. Couldn't tell oh, you. I've mean, written, written down there. It's kind of all a blur, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was. It's been a number of years. It's been a number of years. Okay. Yes. It's all a number right. Years. Um, you've made some important friendships, d it, being in the military and the camaraderie and, of the service. Tell me, tell me about that. I have, and it's the, it's, it's such a unique brotherhood, if you would, when you have a bunch of people and sisterhood, and sisterhood <laughs> sharing the same, the, the same, just the bond that you have because you've gone through certain things that other people wouldn't necessarily understand. And it's, and there's still a, a group of people that I still get together with that I feel so close with that we don't talk to each other very often and we may not see each other very often, but it's, I know they're there to be able to just pick up the phone and and, um, and it's very unique. I've, uh, on another note, um, I lost one of my good friends, um, it'll be two years, um, who uh, she deployed to Afghanistan and she, through PTSD, she committed suicide and um, and you know it's it's nice when we all get together for happy occasions and and we we do um try really hard to 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 make that to make that happen but um through through my former units through my last um as emergency prepared liaison as well it's you know doing our best to keep in touch with each other and mm -hmm. and um i think there was a picture of a my friend Jeannie um, uh, coming back from, yeah. from, and it's from, I believe she was, she was actually in Iraq. She mm -hmm. was in Iraq and, and how it, it's very interesting how things change. Um, Jeannie and I um, have the same skills, the same military skills. She was a military liaison as well? She is a military liaison. She was a um, military liaison for the state of Vermont. I was part of um, the region, mm -hmm. so they were kind of, kind of like under us, like it, the umbrella, it, mm -hmm. you know, all the information rises up. But, um, it, and even though I didn't go overseas, uh, as an emergency prepared liaison officer, depending on what year it is and what month and what the flavor is of the month, is we were considered the 
the last line of defense. So we weren't touched for what's called cross-leveling. If a unit was going overseas and they needed somebody who had your skill, mm -hmm. they could pick you out and you would move to another unit. And that's what happened with Jeannie. Mm -hmm. And Jeannie and I, again, had the same skill and it just so happened that they changed their mind and it very well could have been me that would, went to Iraq or Afghanistan and instead of being here and sometimes you have that guilt you almost feel like you should have been there but just knowing that you're doing the very best that you can to be the the line of the last line of defense and to do your best because you are here and making sure to support those of your comrades that were overseas and uh, I made sure to do that I kept in touch with all my friends who did go overseas and send them care package in the comfort of home and mm -hmm. just um, and things of, of that nature. And I'm proud to say too is that my my um, oldest son followed into the military footsteps. Mm -hmm. He's in, in active duty Air Force. Um, he sometimes. Uh, depending if things aren't going well, blames me for the Air Force part because he wanted to join the Army, but I thought like a mother, instead of a recruiter, and I wanted to make sure that um, um, he, the, the Air Force builds the rec centers before they b get the plane, so I wanted to make sure that he, he was as comfortable as possible, so he's, um, he's, he's uh, in the, the Air Force and he's a newly promoted uh, lieutenant. Now, has he been deployed or no? He has. Um, he okay. has been to Kuwait, and um, he actually mm -hmm. just was um, promoted um, this past March, if, and he has 10 years of service in, in right now. Because mm -hmm. I thought we had a picture. Oh, here we are. Yes, there is a we picture do. of you with your son. Yes. There he is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> With your different military un uniforms. Yes, and yes. Gosh. Yeah, that's a, that's a little while ago, but yeah, that's. But he's still in the service. He's still he's in. Yes, he is still in. He's in um, it, it, uh, Abilene, um, Texas, mm -hmm. Texas right now. And he's got two little boys and a wife and two little boys. So oh. we'll see if they. They actually I should have sent you that picture. That they, my daughter-in-law took a picture of the two. They've just. Um, they're living on base now, which is different. They owned uh, um, a home previously, and the boys, uh, when Reveille, um is played, uh, I'm sorry, Retreat is played, they, they, the customs are to stop and salute the flag, and the boys were in the backyard, and they heard Retreat being called, and she got a picture of the two of them. So they snapped to attention, so, <laughs> so it's nice. I'm wondering, who knows, maybe one of them will follow in, in um, their dad's footsteps. So. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, tell me about your dad writing to you every My day. My dad wrote <coughs> to me every single day of basic training. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get mail every day, but he wrote to me every day. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it would be a pile of letters. And so you would be in formation and the drill sergeant would call your name to come and get your correspondence. and. You'd have to run, never walk. You'd always run to the head of formation, and they'd wait till I get back, and then they'd call me again, and then they wait, and go, yeah. So, and, and he'd always send care packages and um, and goodies, and uh, an Oreo never tasted so good when you haven't had one, and you you're not supposed to have <laughs> one. It never tasted so good, but he did, and he wrote every day, even um, mm -hmm. while I was gone in basic training. My mother actually had open heart surgery. And he still wrote to me every single day, and because he knew the importance of just that, you know that. Well, he's that been. Ladder. He has been there. It, now he has. He has died. He has. Okay. Yes. Um, so he, but he was there. He so was he there. knew what it was like. He, yes. To wait for letters. Yes, he was probably one of my biggest supporters. He he made it to um, graduation, and there was um, s from a storm boot camp from boot camp graduation, and mm -hmm. there was there was um, snow or something was happening with the planes. And uh, again, this is before the cell phones, mm -hmm. and um, I was calling home, talked to um, somebody from home, and they they said that he wasn't going to be able to get there. He was en route, and so I was telling my my fellow uh, friends that um, oh, he's not going to make it and he st stood behind me and said I couldn't miss my daughter the only one marching in step so he uh, he made it and it just uh, 
it was it was very nice. And boot camp and enjoying the military is, is the best thing that I ever did because it makes me appreciate everything that I have. To have everything taken away and then getting it back, um, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't appreciate the opportunity to have um, done something bigger than myself. Mm. So I, I cherish that experience. seems like such a lifetime ago, but I, I, I'll always cherish that experience. Mm. Wow. Um, you, you attended the Women's Memorial, but tell me, tell me about making your 9-11 hike every, every day. Tell me about that. This is how we keep it alive. Um, we found out, I think this is going to be our fourth or fifth year. Um, we happen to fall upon it. Um, the closest this is your Sunday, husband and you? my husband, my husband and I, and of uh, our group has grown. This year we'll be actually doing it. I think there was 21 of us that will be doing this. But what it is is the closest Sunday to 9/11. Um, there's uh, what's called flags on the 48, and there are 48 4,000 foot peaks in New Hampshire, New Hampshire, and you sign up for a peak and what you do is you raise the American flag from 12 to 2 and it's in honor of 9-11 so that we never forget um, but this year is uh, actually um, we'll be flying the American flag which is my retirement flag which flew in Arlington National Cemetery at the Women's Memorial and we'll also be flying the Massachusetts flag and that's in honor of um, the Boston um, Boston Marathon bombings as well. Mm. So it's just a place to um, there you are. remember. And that's also the Iraqi flag up there that my friend Jeannie sent to me mm -hmm. when she um, when she was. That's over you and your husband. Yep, that's my husband and I and Tom. Tom, and we will be um, undertaking that journey in just a couple of short weeks. We'll be up there. Mm -hmm. Um, doing it, doing it again. So that was Mount Bond, um, that one there. That one there. And you just spend a couple hours up there. From 12 to 2 um, is how long we um, keep the flag up there. We spend mm -hmm. uh, more or less. My husband is the one. He he schleps up all the um, the parts of the 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 poles to put them up and lose the sleep over making sure everything is all set um, beforehand mm -hmm. and does the logistics. I was going to ask who carries all of that. Sometimes we, we divide it up. Um, he's his um, tag name is Sherpa Tom, so he um, he's great at organizing <laughs> and uh, organizing these mm -hmm. this event. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it's nice to be. 9-11, I know I'll always hear from certain people who always call um, that we serve together. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of nice to be on the top of a mountain with no cell phone and no service and just mm -hmm. to reflect on, um, on how, lucky, how lucky we are and to not forget you know, the parts of history that you know, make us who we are mm -hmm. today. Is there anything that you wanted to tell us that I haven't thought to ask about? Um, no, I think I think I've touched upon everything. I think we were planning to to talk about. Um, again, mm -hmm. I thank you for this. I thank you for this opportunity. Oh, well, thank you for your service and. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all these stories with us. And that wraps up this interview with Linda Calderiso of Bellingham, Massachusetts. And um, this all will go to the Library of Congress. So thank you so much. And thank thanks you. to um, the C Bellingham ABMI Cable 8 for sponsoring this and providing all of the resources to help make it happen. And thank you for all your time and effort that you put into this, Marjorie, too. It's very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right.